All right. Doo -doo -doo. What did I do? Oh. How did I go back to that? Okay, cool. There's feedback, you've got to turn something off. How do we do that? Oh, how do I do that? I think you must have had the stream playing or something. But or maybe, you, maybe your phone was on Zoom and it was feeding back to your phone or something. Or maybe your maybe your phone was on Zoom and it was feeding back from your phone or something. No. Or maybe your maybe your phone was on Zoom and it was feeding back from your phone or something. It's not working very well. It's just that you don't you don't want to hear yourself. Okay. So Did you work out what it was? Um I won't hear you, Arjuna, because I put my laptop on silent. You want to play with that? So maybe you just write to me on my phone if you want to tell me something. And hopefully you can hear me. Oops. You must have. Had the stream playing. Oh, should I go on Zoom? Okay, let's do that. I'll go back to Zoom. There we go. Mama! Yay! Now I can put this. I'll go back to Zoom. Close all the stems. Mama! Should I close this? There we go. Okay, cool. I closed the YouTube. <laughs> we need Zoom audio on so people can ask questions. Okay, cool. <laughs> about that technical difficulty. But we're ready now, aren't we, Nainamani? Yeah? Let's go. Jaya.
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So a reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, chapter 27, text 21. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Animita Nimitena Svadarmenat Malatmana Tivraya mai bhaktya cha Shuta sambrita ya chiram Animita animitena Svadarmenat malatmana Tivraya mai bhaktya cha Shuta sambrita ya chiram Animita animitena Svadarmenat malatmana Tivraya mai bhaktya cha Shuta samrita ya chiram Okay. Um, so now we'll do word for word. <coughs> Shri Bhagavan Uvacha the Supreme Personality of God had said, <clears throat> Animita animitena, without desiring the fruits of activities. Svadharmena, by executing one's prescribed duties. Amala atmana, with a pure mind. Tivraya, serious. Mahi, unto me. Bhaktya, by devotional service. Cha, and. Shuta, hearing. Sambritaya, endowed with. Jiram, for a long time. Translation. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, one can get liberation by seriously discharging devotional service unto me and thereby hearing for a long time about me or from me. By thus executing one's prescribed duties, there will be no reaction and one will be free, freed from the contamination of matter. Purport by Shila Prabhupada, Shila Prabhupada, Ki, Jai. This is a really long purport and it has lots of parts to it. Okay, let's go. Shijar Swami comments in this connection that by association with material nature alone, one does not become conditioned. Conditional life begins only after one is infected by the modes of material nature. It's a pretty good point. If someone is in contact with the police department, that does not mean that he's a criminal. As long as one does not commit criminal acts, even though there is a police department, he's not punished. Similarly, the liberated soul is not affected, although he is in material nature. Even the Supreme Personality of Godhead is supposed to be in association with material nature when he descends, but he's not affected. One has to act in such a way that in spite of being in the material nature, he is not affected by contamination. Although the lotus flower is in association with water, it does not mix with the water. That is how one has to live as described here by the personality of Godhead Kapila Dev. Animita nimitena sva dharmena malatmana. One long word. One can 
be liberated from all adverse circumstances simply by seriously engaging in devotional service. How this develop, how this devotional service develops and becomes mature is explained here. In the beginning, one has to perform his prescribed duties with a clean mind. Clean consciousness means Krishna consciousness. One has to perform his prescribed duties in Krishna consciousness. There is no necessity of changing one's prescribed duties. One simply has to act in Krishna consciousness. In discharging Krishna conscious duties, one should determine whether by his professional or occupational duties, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is satisfied. In another place in the Bhagavatam, it is said, Sanushti tasya dharmasya samsidid haritoshanam. Everyone has some prescribed duties to perform, but the perfection of such duties will be reached only if the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari is satisfied by such actions. For example, Arjuna's prescribed duty was to fight, and the perfection of his fighting was tested by the satisfaction of Krishna. Krishna wanted him to fight, and when he fought for the satisfaction of the Lord, that was the perfection of his professional devo devotional duty. Professional devotional duty. <laughs> On the other hand, when Contrary to the wish of Krishna, he was not willing to fight. That was imperfect. If one wants to be perfect, his life, oops, sorry. If one wants to perfect his life, he should discharge his prescribed duties for the satisfaction of Krishna. One must act in Krishna consciousness, for such action will never produce any reaction. Animita nimitane. This is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Yagyar tat karma no nyatra. All activities should be performed simply for yagya, or the satisfaction of Vishnu. Anything done otherwise, without the satisfaction of Vishnu or yagya, produces bondage. So here it is also prescribed by Kapila Muni that one can transcend material entanglement by acting in Krishna consciousness, which means seriously engaging in devotional service. This serious devotional service can develop by hearing for long periods of time. Chanting and hearing is the beginning of the process of devotional service. One should associate with devotees and hear from them about the Lord's transcendental appearance activities, disappearance, instructions, etc. One more paragraph. There are two kinds of shruti, or scripture. One is spoken by the Lord, and the other is spoken about the Lord and his devotees. Bhagavad Gita is the former, and Sriman Bhagavatam, the latter. One must hear these scriptures repeatedly, from reliable sources in order to become fixed in serious devotional service. Through engagement in such devotional service, one becomes freed from the contamination of maya. It is stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam that hearing about the Supreme Personality of Godhead cleanses the heart of all contamination caused by the influence of the three modes of material nature. By continuous, regular hearing, the effects of the contamination of lust and greed to enjoy or lord it over material nature diminish. And when lust and greed diminish, one then becomes situated in the mode of goodness. This is the stage of Brahman realization or spiritual realization. In this way, one becomes fixed on the transcendental platform. Remaining fixed on the transcendental platform is liberation from material entanglement. 
Oma gyanat mirandasya gyanan jana shalakaya chakshu unmita nena tazma shri gurave namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasari Gaura Vakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Translation again The Supreme Personality of Godhead said One can get liberation by seriously discharging devotional service unto me and thereby hearing for a long time about me or from me by thus executing one's prescribed duties, there will be no reaction, and one will be freed from the contamination of matter. Okay, good morning everyone. I don't even know if anyone's there, but okay. <laughs> Hopefully someone is hearing, and if not, that's okay too. Um, <clears throat> so, first of all, what struck in this verse, struck me, is that Kapila Dev Krishna is saying um, this this term seriously discharging devotional service. So it's not like a hobby, it's not a sprinkle here and there, but it's you know our main occupation. And also um, sorry, I just wanted to see if anyone was telling me something. Um he emphasizes hearing. So those are the two things I wanted to focus on. And the the consequence or, or the effect of hearing and seriously engaging in devotional service is that we we don't accrue reactions, which means we are kind of stopping um, stopping the cycle of birth and death, basically, because that's what we want, right? Try to make this life the last and yeah, not have to get another body for the reactions of the activities we're doing. So I I was inspired by something I read this morning. One of the things I read this morning was, um, let's see if I can find it, um, a friend of mine, uh, Samohini from, that lives in Melbourne now, um, she sent me this <laughs> Prabhupada Uvacha that um, is quite, you know, strong and says instead of contemplating what will happen to this world you have got a short duration of life say 50 60 years you can chant Hare Krishna and go back home back to Godhead don't consider what will happen to this world nature will take care of it you don't puzzle your brain with these thoughts you utilize whatever time you have got in your possession and you go back to home back to Godhead you cannot check Best thing is that you your life and go back to home, back to Godhead. Because people will go on with their rascal civilization. Natural consequences will be there. You better take advantage of whatever time you have got and become fully Krishna conscious and go back to home. This is from a morning walk, February 21, 1975. I can't see where it is, though. So. Um, yeah, so Prabhupada here is just emphasizing, just be serious about it, go back home. Don't worry about anything else. Obviously, at other times, he's em emphasizing that we um, try to help others also become Krishna conscious, not just ourselves. But we have to start somewhere. And um, so if we're strong in our Krishna consciousness, then we can help others. <clears throat> and like my, my spiritual master said to me, and I was remembering the other day, the more Krishna you give, the more Krishna you get. So it's also a balance. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this verse is um, kind of encouraging to those of us hopefully most of us that want to attain steady bhakti and you know get to the nishta platform and yeah not just sometimes be enthusiastic and sometimes not and like up and down but to actually you know always want to um, think of what Krishna wants and be Krishna consciousness like Prabhupada says in the purport many times we have to be Krishna conscious we have to be Krishna conscious which means you know considering Krishna's desires um, and in that way we can stop being affected 
or infected by the modes. <laughs> Which I feel like it's like you're being tossed around in the ocean, you know, and bombarded by these modes. Yesterday, um, the, the loft did its program um, in a small uh, ashram in the city instead of at the loft itself and with you know 10 people and the whole you know t one meter apart and everything and there were some people there I guess and I was trying to explain um, yeah basically trying to encourage everyone to start practicing bhakti and um, the angle I took was that there's some people you know there's two categories of people one is the ones that when you ask them they say I'm fine I'm good you know they don't want to change anything and it's basically they're in denial and so they're not interested um, in these things and bhakti right now in their spiritual journey and also um, there's the people that are actually completely satisfied which are you know enlightened pure devotees that also fit in that category but they're actually you know satisfied <laughs> and then there's the other category of people which I was saying I hope you are you're fit in this category because the presentation is for that um, group which is those that want to be a better version of themselves that's how I worded it or the best version of themselves and because we at some times in our day we aren't uh, the best we can be in terms of um, I explained it because that's what's relevant for me and I hope it's relevant for others as well that sometimes we have certain emotions that overcome us like um, anger or envy or um, depression or anxiety and I was saying it's like clouds that don't let us see the sun Right now the sun's shining, there's barely any clouds and you can probably feel the warmth if you're outside, but when there's clouds, as soon as there's a cloud, especially at this time of the year, you really feel cold, <laughs> even if it's in the middle of the day, and it's just blocking all the warmth coming from the sun. And in the same way, when we're overcome by these strong emotions, then we can't really experience the nature of the soul which is to be you know peaceful and experiencing lots of love and all these things it's the opposite we're suffering basically and um, I also explained about you know the moans and that's also stopping us from being in our natural state of happiness and bliss <clears throat> so the way that here we are hearing <laughs> um, the solution to this problem that we see. Oh, first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about that beautiful analogy of the lotus flower untouched by water. And here in New Rashan, we can see them, you know, the lilies um, when you walk towards from the temple to Govardhan Hill, and there's that little pond and beautiful, like two shades of pink. and yeah, they're not touched by the water. And there's many names for in Sanskrit for lotus. And which one was it? Pankaja or something that means that's like born from the mud or something? Anyways, I shouldn't go into that because I don't know the technical details. But basically, it's like this lotus is surrounded by mud, but it's completely clean. <laughs> and in that same way, we can be surrounded by material modes of material energy, but we can still remain pure in terms of our consciousness. And I I remembered that in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also says that analogy in the chapter in verse 10, which is, one who performs his duty without attachment, surrendering the results unto the Supreme Lord, is unaffected by sinful action as the lotus leaf is untouched by water. And part of the purport, um, Prabhupada is saying, 
one who knows perfectly well that everything belongs to Krishna, that he is the proprietor of everything, and that therefore everything is engaged in the service of the Lord, naturally has nothing to do with the results of his activities, whether virtuous or sinful. Even one's material body being a gift of the Lord for carrying out a particular type of action can be engaged in Krishna consciousness. That sentence is so cool. We're given this body, it's a gift from Krishna, and it has certain qualities, certain things that it's good, good for. <laughs> so if we use it, um, this body that's actually Krishna's, for Krishna's pleasure, um, then we can be like it's saying here, like the lotus, and be untouched by reactions, um, yeah, by karma. So our body is Krishna's, and it's meant to be engaged in the service. And I was thinking of an example back in the day when I worked for a very short time in the corporate world. I was given a laptop at Deloitte. <laughs> I was like, woo, score, I got a laptop, because at that time it wasn't that common that everyone had a laptop, at least not in Argentina. And But, of course, it was given to me to use for work, not for my own enjoyment. And that's what's expected, right? It's, it's not to be on Facebook or whatever. Actually, I don't even know if I was on Facebook at that time. It was a long time ago. But um, yeah, it was just to, to engage in work for the company. And that's why the company gave me the laptop, not for anything else, <laughs> which makes sense. And um, so whatever body and mind we have in this life, we are meant to engage that to please Krishna, and that's what gives meaning to our lives. I was trying to explain that as well yesterday to the guests, that <clears throat> there's two things that we have wrong um, in materialistic mankind, civilization. Um, one is our identity, and the other our purpose, and they're very related. So if we think, we all know this as devotees, but it doesn't mean that we can't hear it again and again until we actually have realization, at least for myself. If we think that we're the body and the mind, then our purpose is to give happiness, satisfaction to the body and the mind. But if we understand that we're not that, that we're the spirit soul, we're, I didn't say this yesterday, we're a servant of Krishna, but that's who we actually are. And our purpose is to serve Krishna. And that's when our life has meaning and is meaningful. If not, everyone's looking for what's the purpose in their lives because, you know, if you just try to satisfy your mind and your body, you're never going to be satisfied. So then your life feels like empty. And probably if you talk with a lot of old people, yeah, you can get some realization <laughs> from that. Um, but at the same time, I was trying to um, remember what uh, Mother Irmala said recently that, and this verse says as well, that we're not meant to, let's see how it says. Oh, it's actually not in this verse, it's in the verse I was reading before from the 510, that um, Krishna is saying, surrendering the results unto the Supreme Lord and because everything we do, we're not in control of the results. And that's such an important thing to understand on a deep level. It'll save us a lot of headache. Um, what we're in control of is our intention and our attitude. So devotional service is actually a very internal affair. It's not an external thing. Because... The only one that actually knows our intention and our attitude is Krishna. And so everything we're doing during the day is we're trying to express to Krishna that we're trying to love him. At least that that can try to be our attitude. <laughs> <clears throat> and then <clears throat> this purpose has many parts. And then another part is talking about, um, it's referencing different verses from Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. So one of them, is in the first canto, chapter 2, 
Verse 13, O best among the twice-born, it is therefore concluded that the highest perfection one can achieve by discharging the duties prescribed for one's own occupation, according to caste divisions and orders of life, is to please the personality of Godhead. And Prabhupada really emphasizes it. He puts italics, says, and in, and, and, and in each and every one of the above-mentioned divisions of life, you know, like um, Varnashrama, and this is the italics, the aim must be to please the supreme authority of the personality of Godhead. And when that, that is not the aim, that's when we get the caste system because the aim becomes material. I want to please my body and, and mind and I exploit others to get what I want. So that's when it doesn't work anymore and that's what we see. And... Uh, in many parts of India. But the actual purpose of our Nashrama is so that we can just use our body and mind in what it's good at and there's harmony in society and we're all trying to please Krishna with our professional devotional service like Prabhupada said. <laughs> um, and also, you know, the orders of life, the duties of a Grihasta, the duties of a Brahmachari, you know, Vanaprastha and Sannyas. Yeah, and then Prabhupada, in that purport, he quotes the verse from Bhagavad Gita 4.13, where Krishna is saying, you know, it's our nature and our activities, not our birth, that determines what we should do. Um, and then there's also reference in the purport um, of today's verse to sacrifice. And so I looked it up. This famous verse as well from Bhagavad Gita. Work done as sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. This is 3.9. Otherwise, work causes bondage in this material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction. And in that way, you will always remain free from bondage. So Krishna says this a lot. You know, this idea that we should be sacrificing for him. And that way, we won't be touched by um, karma uh, or reactions and we'll be bound to this we'll be free from this world and you know when a teacher says something a lot it means that it's important <laughs> and I was just this morning I was um, reading Arshila Prabhupada a friend to all the, the book I'm still kind of halfway through by Mula Prakriti Devi Dasi and it's all you know accounts of different people that met Prabhupada before he came to the West. And this is a really famous account and probably most of you have heard it, but, it, and I knew it was coming and I knew I always get emotional when I read it because it's just, it's so touching the sacrifice that Prabhupada has done for us. And it's that um, pastime where he would go to Advaita Bhavan um, in Shantipur, I think, I think I went there once for a festival to distribute prasadam for thousands of pilgrims. And um, he would go there and chant japa very seriously and sincerely and, you know, with a lot of emotion and for a long time, long periods of time. And the devotee, the pujari from that place, um, or the caretaker, he, you know, became attracted to Prabhupada by his sincere chanting, but he never actually talked with him much, but he would come often, and then he didn't come for some time, and then he came back, and he was wearing saffron, and, yeah, he was really chanting with tears in his eyes, and, and let me see if I can just show and read it, because it's so nice, just parts of it. <clears throat> It's just so touching. Okay, so in 1965, August, that's when he came in Saffron. And he, Prabhupada went to this devotee and said, yeah, Pujari, and said, and thanked him for the seva that he was doing at Advaita Bhavan. 
And so this Pujari asked him, Who are you? I remember you from so long ago. He replied, My name is Abhai Charanaravinda Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj. I am an unworthy disciple of His Divine Grace, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada, my Divine Master. I have been coming here for such a long time because my Gurudev has given me an impossible mission. His desire was for me to go across the ocean to the western countries and spread the sublime teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. There are countless souls there who have never heard of Sri Sri Radha Krishna, and so they are suffering greatly. I have not known how this mission of his will be successful. So I've been coming here to this special house of Advaita Charya, where he, Nityananda Prabhu, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would gather together to plan the Sankirtan movement. It was here that they launched the inundation of love of God that swept India and continues to this day. What a special place. Thus, I have been praying very earnestly here that they will also, they will all give me their mercy, that somehow they will empower me and guide me. I want to satisfy my Gurudev's desire, but I am feeling unqualified to do this. As he was speaking to me, I saw tears falling down on his cheeks again. Then he continued, Tomorrow I am leaving for Calcutta to go upon a ship across the ocean to America. I do not know what will befall me there, but I am praying most earnestly here for help. Then he very humbly asked me for my blessings. I was indeed moved by this Vaishnava's sincerity and determination as I watched him depart upon his journey. And then we all know what happened. A few years later, this devotee started seeing um, all these um, white Vaishnavas <laughs> or Western Vaishnavas um, coming to Advaita Bhavan and chanting on beads and, and the dhotis and saris. And they didn't talk with him, but they gave him a back to Godhead. And then he saw the picture of Prabhupada and recognized him and saw that he was the founder of Acharya <laughs> of Iskand and had brought Krishna to West. <laughs> then I realized that he had actually accomplished that impossible mission of his Gurudev. I saw that it was indeed he, starting alone and without pretense, who had accomplished this glorious miracle against all odds. And yeah, so then he went to Mayapur and, and shared that with the devotees so that they knew. It's just amazing how much Prabhupada has sacrificed for us and it just it makes it really real, Krishna consciousness, how he was perfectly fine in Vrindavan in terms of his own bhakti because he's already in love with Krishna, but he just went to the West. And externally he suffered so much. I was, we're just reading the Sri Prabhupada Lila Amrita with my husband and um, just the conditions of where he went in uh, the Bari were horrible. They were like, you know, people that were um, homeless in the streets, like many, many, many homeless people. And then sometimes, you know, like it was a daily affair that they would just die and then someone would call the police and get them picked up and gone, you know, and it was just so dangerous. And yeah, imagine the consciousness of all these drunks and yeah. But still Prabhupada went there so that he could share Krishna consciousness with those that were most attracted. The young people that were, you know, hippies or open-minded at the time. Instead of staying with the um, Mishra, or his name was the yogi that was in, you know, up, uptown with all the rich people, he went to like the lowest of the lowest. And that's where it started. Yeah, just, I guess, um, I was reading this newsletter from Satinandan Swami, Satsharan Agati, and someone asked him, um, does everyone, every devotee have a mission in their life? And he said, yes. Let's see if I can find it. Every devotee has a mission. 
maybe it's not like you know being leader or doing something like you know that externally seems grand but our mission is like we're reading in this um, verse to engage our gift of this body that Krishna gave us in this life in his service and to please him and that's our mission and that's what will give us satisfaction and we have that experience um, day in and day out that when we do something for Krishna we are, our, Krishna reciprocates in our heart <clears throat> also in that um, newsletter there's a there's a section that's written by Prabhupada and it's also <laughs> very intense I'll just read it it's from a lecture in London 1973 a devotee is always prasanatma because his happiness is to serve Krishna his only business is to see Krishna happy that's all this is devotion there may be loss or gain, there may be victory or defeat, there may be distress or happiness, it doesn't matter. He's not affected by, with this duality. That is being taught in the Bhagavad Gita from beginning until the end. Krishna is teaching. That's all. Sam Sam Sidir Haritoshanam, which is the verse we were just reading before, 1, 2, 13. The Bhagavata also confirms this. You do not look after whether it is loss or gain, but you have to see whether Krishna is satisfied. That's all. That is your only business. That is your only business. So if we have this internal mood of how can I satisfy Krishna, how can I please Krishna, then we're on the spiritual platform and nothing can affect us. Also, I just wanted to... Um, yeah... Maybe this is the last one of the last points I'll talk about. That it's emphasizing a lot um, hearing about Krishna and hearing from Krishna, and at least and that's my focus right now in my life. My japa, it's there, but it's yeah, because of the certain situation I'm in with a baby that wakes up many times during the night. And anyways, maybe there are excuses, but my I'm mainly focusing on. Hearing in the sense of um, <clears throat> reading. And we heard yesterday by Prana Prabhu, he was explaining, you know, the five main activities that are, um, the Rupa Goswami says in the Nectar of Devotion. And he talked a lot about creating a sacred space for chanting. And I think that's amazing. And <laughs> I hope to put that in practice at some point soon. And he also talked about the uh, importance of going to the holy places and I was just reading about that um, in the Manashiksha book how yeah we can feel more Krishna conscious where we're when we're you know at the actual place where Krishna you know stepped with his lotus feet and we can enter into that mood and Sri Ram Swami was making the point that all of these items they fit like a jigsaw puzzle Prabhupada gave us this so that we can um, be Krishna conscious and one of them is you know hearing Bhagavatam and hearing Bhagavad Gita and it's just, it's just I think at this point in my life that's where the nectar is for me I, that's where I, I get most of my taste in Krishna consciousness and I understand that everyone has you know different inclinations but I just wanted to share this one because <laughs> that's mine and um, just just reading Krishna book is amazing. I was just reading yesterday. It was just <laughs> that Balaram goes to Naimisharanya and there's all these sages and brahmanas and they're all, you know, bowing down because they know Balaram is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But Irma Harshana just stays in the Vyasa sun and he doesn't even get up. <laughs> and Balaram's like so he throws the kusha grass and cuts his head off. It's just to he also show us, you know, that humility is so important and recognition of, you know, Krishna's position. I'm not thinking that we're better than Krishna. It's just, yeah. But then Balaram is really humble and he's like, okay, I can bring him back to life because the Brahmanas kind of 
a bit upset because they needed him for the sacrifice. And the Brahmin is like, no, no, if that was your desire, it's fine. But we also need to do the sacrifice. So what do we do? And so then Father Ram said, okay, you just put his son because the son is the representative of the father. <laughs> I, don't know, I just I think everything in Krishna book is nectar, <laughs> to be honest. And um, the more we read, the more we can remember Krishna during the day. Like Mother Amala is doing this, preparing this book about remembering Krishna with everything, with the sunshine, with everything around us, with sound, with the, with hearing, you know, the birds, their Krishna's um, voice that I read that the other day in Krishna book. And just everything can remind us of Krishna. And so we can be in touch with him constantly. <clears throat> and yeah, so just to finish on a happy note, um, I wanted to share with you all the my favorite verse of Bhagavad Gita. I'll just grab it. So, so I don't mess up because I'm so rusty with my shloka. Machita Makata Prana Bodayanta Parasparam Katayantas Chama Nityam Tushati Charamanticha. The thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me. Their lives are fully devoted to my service, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss from always enlightening one another and conversing about me. So, this is one of the other items of the five items, um, Sadhu Sangha serving the devotees and so maybe today when we are with devotees we can try to talk a little bit about Krishna besides you know maybe talking about service or practical things um, my husband was sharing with me that when he was in the ashram his first few years um, at Mahavan's ashram it was very strict that they weren't supposed to talk about anything but Krishna so they would sit around <laughs> having prasadam and say well, what are you reading <laughs> and so they'd share about what they're reading but it's it's nectar, and so then it also kind of makes us like, oh, I should be reading so that I have something to share about Krishna. And then Krishna consciousness becomes dynamic and alive because there's always something you can, you know, be meditating on if you're reading. And yeah, also, of course, you can say share realizations about service or japa. But I don't know, I thought that was, was cool. Yeah, Krishna's saying, you know, the devotees, they talk about him and they derive great satisfaction and they're enlightening one another yeah their hearts and souls are constantly submerged in krishna and they take pleasure in discussing him with other devotees and this is something that's really uh, um in almost all the the different accounts from the book all the devotees say that they would see Prabhupada engaging in Krishna Kata with his dear God brothers. So that was something they did a lot. Sometimes to the point that <laughs> Prabhupada wouldn't even open his um, pharmaceutical office, um, shop because he was engaging in Krishna Kata with his dear God brother, I think it's Keshava Maharaj. So they were so absorbed that you know they forgot time and, and space. They were in another platform. And we can also you know, experience that when we talk about Krishna. And those that have children, we can, you know, talk about Krishna's pastimes and Krishna book and get into the emotions of it and experience spiritual emotions. Yeah. So that's all for me, from me. I don't think there's anyone in Zoom, so probably there's going to be no questions. Um, I don't know how to check uh, Facebook from here because it's not open. Uh, I'll check Facebook. Hang on. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Another thing while, while we wait, if there's anything. Um, yesterday I was talking with this guest after the, the presentation, and she said that she had started she was older and she had started reading Bhagavad Gita many times on and read a little bit and then stop and like she couldn't really 
continue reading it. She couldn't, for some reason, she couldn't get into it. And she said that she was encouraged because I said that the qualities of the self, of the soul, are are explained in chapter two. And she said, oh, I'm encouraged to read it now because I want to read that chapter two. So it seems like she hadn't gone past chapter one. And I was saying, oh, um, you know, you can, you can go straight to chapter two uh, because chapter one has a lot of names and long names of uh, people that were in the war and maybe, you know, right. For the first time, someone reading it may be better to just get into the, you know, teachings of Krishna. And I was explaining to her that the purports are really important as well and because sometimes people might think, oh, I'll just read the verses, you know, why do I need to read the purports? <laughs> but I feel that when you know Prabhupada, then you want to hear from him. When you understand that how much he sacrificed and he, that he's a pure devotee, he's in touch with Krishna, then you, you're eager to hear from, from Prabhupada's realizations. And so I was telling her the story of Prabhupada, you know, how he went on the ship and he had the heart attacks and he did all this so that he could share um, bhakti yoga with the world so it wasn't stuck in India. And um, yeah, hopefully that also encouraged her to, to read and hear more. Um, when she right now she has a bit of a you know understanding of who Prabhupada is and maybe start to um, develop that relationship. <clears throat> is there anything there, um, Arjuna? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Ah, no, there's no questions. Okay, cool. All right, I hope everyone has a very Krishna conscious day. Um, Shima Bhavatam Ki Jai.